Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar, Careers Outside of Academia. We have four panelists joining us today who will give their insight into how they made the transition from an academic science-based career into a non-academic career. Um, there's a, just a few things that I would like to bring to your attention before we start. So firstly, this webinar was partially um, organized through the Working Group on Careers, Jobs and Funding, which is a group of early career scientists that EG are sort of co-organizing with to be able to provide more information and um, skills and representation for um, non-academic science paths. Um, and so this is the first webinar that we are doing as part of this. Um, if you want some more information on the working groups or for in the early career science information, then take a look at the EGU website. So with that, I will now introduce the panelists and well, I ask them to introduce themselves really um, to the webinar today. So I will start with Dr. Liam Brannigan. Welcome. Um, you are a senior data scientist at a startup company in Belfast. Yeah, uh, thanks Jenny. Yeah, so my name is Liam Brannigan. I did my PhD in physical oceanography in Oxford, followed by a postdoc between Oxford and the Oceanography Centre in Southampton, and then a further two-year um, postdoc at the Meteorology Institute in Stockholm. Um, at that point, I felt like I wanted a bit more life stability rather than facing another, another short postdoc and fellowship applications and faculty applications. So I got in touch with a recruiter in Belfast and uh, then I was astonished at the pace that things move outside the academic world that I sent my CV in a Saturday, I had an interview on the Tuesday, another interview on the Tuesday, on the Thursday, and a job offer on that same day that I started two weeks later. So I've been the, the first data scientist at Analytic Extensions, and the work has been super diverse in the two years that I've been there. For example, this year I've been building a search engine for investigative journalists, doing geospatial analysis of air pollution dispersion, looking at computer vision analysis of videos taking of the seafloor, um, looking at analysis of DNA sequences and so on and so on. At times it's felt like you're starting a new postdoc every three or four weeks and you've just got to frantically get up with what literature you can get and, and get on GitHub and get, get the new code. Um, so that's, and then this year I was made senior, senior data scientist. So um, it's been a great transition for me that uh, we uh, started uh, a family sort of two a year and a half ago, two years ago, and it's given a really nice kind of change in, in work-life balance. And it's also just been a really kind of interesting and, and fast-paced change that has been built on the, the skills that I learned in my PhD. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, now I'll introduce Carly Mattis. Um, she is a researcher in schools physics teacher in Greater Manchester, um, and her PhD was in the atmospheric field. Um, hello, so yeah, thanks Jenny, I'm Carly and as Jenny says, I am currently a teacher um, but with researchers in schools. I started off with, with a PhD in meteorology at Reading University and while there I was engaged in lots of student outreach, lots of activities and I was really enjoying getting the kids engaged in science and um, I started to enjoy that towards the end a little bit more than my PhD, I'm not going to lie. So I started to look for teaching jobs that I could potentially do and I stumbled across because there's teach first and there's other routes into teaching if you want to go straight into the classroom but I stumbled across researchers in schools um, I'll just give you a little bit of information on those so they are a charity part of the brilliant club funded by the government to get people with PhDs into schools to try and improve um, student education and access to higher education in the UK um, just some stats, one in four students from a highly, um, from an advantaged background go to highly selective universities in the UK, but only one in 50 from a disadvantaged background get picked. So part of the brilliant club and, and researchers in schools is to try and up those numbers. So that's, I'm based in um, a deprived area of Manchester um, at a school that has a lot of challenges to try and get those kids to see that they can go to university and they can apply to these highly selective universities. What also um, I found interesting about the Researchers in Schools programme is that you're in school four days a week, learn in your first year, getting your QTS, learning how to teach, um, which a lot of it comes natural if you've done demonstrating and things like that during your PhD, it's quite easy to adapt. Um, but then the other day, the fifth day of the week, you are, for the first two years, you can continue to do your research 
um, and you're paid to do that. So it's, it's a nice, if you're not sure whether teaching's for you, it's a nice stepping stone. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to, even though I wasn't enjoying my PhD at the end, uh, I just wanted to see the back of it. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to leave research behind fully. So it was nice to be able to do one day a week doing my research. Um, this year, I'm now in my third year of teaching. Um, I have since parked my own research and I've, in meteorology and I've actually started to do some educational research um, looking at um, how we learn and, and how we can engage with our students more. So I've gone more the other way. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Ashley Musser, who is a process, data, process architect at risk, JBA Risk Management. Ashley. Yep, hi. Uh, um, I am a process architect at JBA Risk Management, like Jenny just said. Um, JBA Risk Management is um, the global leader in flood risk science. So, for example, we were the first to make global flood maps av available commercially. Um, and science is always at the heart of what uh, JBA Risk Management does, just um, yeah, making things available commercially for industries such as insurance, reinsurance and financial sectors. Um, a process architect, I'll give it like a sort of a explanation of that because it's a bit of a difficult term to get your head around sometimes. Um, a process architect is essentially um, a person who assesses a process or methodology and designs a leaner, more efficient template for that process without affecting the quality output. Um, the process architect then oversees that template um, development into broad scale production. So, for example, at JBA, I lead the development of templates that aim to redesign our current processes required um, to use on our hydraulic model. Um, and sometimes this requires redesign, sometimes it requires inventing completely new processes. Um, so over the last year, I've worked on templates that cover how we can create and quality check inputs more uniformly, um, playing with boundary conditions on a hydraulic model to look at how we fundamentally predict flooding, um, and also managing and steering the development of an automated system as well. Um, my PhD was in ice core science. I was developing a numerical model to um, estimate the age depth profile of ice cores. Um, so my background has always been encoding numerical modeling and software development and that has lent itself quite well to the process architect role um, as well as also using some of the skills that you learn from a geography degree as well. Okay that's great thank you Ashley and finally we have Dr Robin Andrews who is a freelance science journalist with a background in volcanology. Hey uh, so yeah, I uh, I always wanted to study something about volcanoes ever since a video game when I was 10 convinced me that uh, Death Mountain <laughs> was a real volcano and I could go see it and uh, you know uh, there was lava pouring in from the walls and everything was kind of crazy and obviously that's not how volcanoes work but it basically put me on the path to wanting to study volcanoes and that's what I stubbornly wanted to do. Uh, it's quite a weird thing to do in the UK for a lot of people I think because loads of teachers are asking me like well you know there aren't any volcanoes in the UK which is kind of the point um, and uh, eventually I did go on to do my PhD it was at the University of Otago in New Zealand and I looked at uh, well it was in experimental volcanology which meant building weird experiments with explosives in a lab or in the desert or you know uh, disused bunkers to work out why certain volcanoes just kind of explode like bombs underground uh, don't know, still don't know, um, but um, it was fun. Uh, but I really, I, <laughs> during the PhD, it became very clear that academia was not for me for a few reasons. Uh, one of which was just the fact that I felt like I had no control over where I was going to live for a decade, which it was, I love traveling, but that was, that seems, you know, that seems quite a lonely existence for me. So I, um, uh, and other than that, I was quite impatient. You know, I much prefer telling people who weren't scientists about what was going on in science rather than spending years and years on one problem. Um, so I transitioned to uh, science journalism quite quickly, actually. I didn't really do anything in between. I kind of, whilst doing the PhD, was distracted by a few friends of mine and doing like uh, blog posts for certain uh, websites. And I had a go for a bit and quite liked it. Uh, so uh, when I uh, graduated from my PhD I for a year basically was back in the UK trying to work out how the hell to get into this properly and after a bit of freelancing I ended up working for a 
uh, a news outlet for a while that it was that was great in some ways and just terrible in others. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, I decided to go freelance. Um, I had no idea if it would work on a financial or professional level. I just felt like I just have to give it a go whilst I could. Um, and uh, it turns out it does work um, if you're quite persistent and, uh, you know, I guess if you're not terrible writing about things like volcanoes and uh, yeah, now I write for anywhere that will basically ha let me write about weird rocks doing weird things. So anything from volcanoes and earthquakes to entire planets, uh, sometimes stars, even though that doesn't really count. Um, and uh, right now I'm writing a popular science book on, on volcanoes, which uh, hopefully is a bit of a sort of PR corrective because most people see volcanoes as sort of, you know, uh, rocky terrorists who just explode and kill people whenever they feel like it. Whereas actually most of the time volcanoes are awesome and cool and great and tell us a lot about the planets they belong to. And that's kind of the point of the book. So, so yeah, um, it's great fun. And uh, uh, I'm certainly glad that I did take those risks to get me to that point rather than just decide that academia was what I was supposed to do. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for those introductions. Really broad uh, variety of backgrounds and also current roles that everybody is in now. Um, and I think I'll start the discussion by um, bringing up um, something that one or two of you kind of touched on um, in your introduction, and that was what are the, the skills that you learned during your PhD that you think has um, either made your job perfect for you or a relatively easy transition, or what are these transferable skills that we hear quite a lot of, um, and how do you think that um, from your PhD you learned these skills that people might not be aware of um, if they just see themselves as a researcher. Um, so we'll start with, uh, with Liam, do you have any, uh, any input for that? Um, yeah, there are some soft skills, definitely how to present technical stuff is a big part of what I do. The kind of more, the other part is in terms of the hard skills was that I started using Twitter and looking at data science Twitter and realized that there were people in companies doing kind of software engineering processes, which would make my science better. So I started getting involved in open source uh, software and that's kind of one recommendation I would make to people is that if you get involved in open source software, you'll learn how to be a much better software engineer and do better scientific analysis. And then you'd also learn a lot of more like industry kind of skills by getting involved in those processes in terms of using version control, in terms of doing testing and more kind of rigorous, not just one scientist hacking away. So that was a kind of a big plus for me when I came for my interview, the, the company afterwards told me that they'd saw that I'd been involved in that kind of thing. And it gave them confidence that I wasn't just a classic kind of like I've been during my PhD, scientific hacker who's just bashing away kind of terrible code, but had kind of developed some skills that would actually make that transition a lot easier. Okay, great. And Ashley, you also said something quite similar to that in terms of um, software and having a background in, in sort of modeling. Um, how did you find the transition with these sorts of skills? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Liam, actually. So my background from my PhD like I really considered myself like a modeler and quite good at coding. But yeah, when I started in the like private sector, one thing that I realized was that yeah, version control and open source software, um, yeah, being able to like handle Git repositories and and also like yeah, rigorous testing, um, like unit and system test um sort of systems. They they were completely over my head when I when I first started. But you, you do really actually become a much better software engineer um, by working as part of, I guess, part of a team and a team of software developers is one one massive bonus. And um, I was thinking um, in terms of like soft skills that you develop during a PhD that transfer really well into the non-academic, like or a non-academic role. Um, when I was going for a job, quite often I got um, like one of the like questions that I would get in the interview is how are you at prioritizing things and I remember at the time feeling like like still being quite academic in my thinking and just being like how do I answer that like that's that's obvious like of course I can prioritize stuff but you don't realize actually like through a PhD like three or four or however many years of a huge project which is also part of another huge project with other people working on different elements you you, you automatically learn how to prioritize and triage tasks and work to so many different deadlines that actually that works in your favor massively when you get into a non-academic role because they actually they really care about knowing that you can do that um, and I think also 
like critical thinking as well is a massive one it's like that sort of open term of what is critical thinking but being able to challenge somebody else's idea in a meeting um, and being able to really yeah put forward your own opinion is something that is also really valued when you join a join a I guess join a company as a, a PhD like okay great Thank you. Um, then with Robin and Carly, I guess your roles seem more um, communication based. You have to be very good at communicating either to the public or to, to children. So Carly, you mentioned that you'd picked up some of that from doing outreach um, during your PhD. What sort of specific skills were you thinking of? Um, yeah, so, so when I was doing outreach or even demonstrating, I suppose, to an extent, although university students are very different to children, um, just the skills like having the confidence to stand in front of them. It's very different to standing in front of academics, to stand in front of children, no matter the age. Um, I personally couldn't work with primary, they scare me, um, but secondary are quite challenging. And, and so doing outreach with secondary built up that confidence to, to have conversations with them and, and, and how to communicate with them. Uh, I think as well, my PhD helped, um, because as soon as I've, I've been doing lots of CPD for my school and because, I've, because I'm used to reading journal articles for my PhD, that's followed on into teaching. So I'm constantly reading articles to improve my teaching and I'm taking them back into school. So it's, um, my school aren't used to it because they've never done research-based teaching before, um, which is a big change for our school. Um, but they're enjoying it and I'm enjoying learning new techniques. So again, it's something it's transferable and, and papers you can read papers in any profession I'm guessing and bring that in and, and bring changes and things like that okay yeah great thank you um, and Robin I will ask you a similar question but we already have a question for you on the Q&A that kind of ties in with this with this question uh -huh. did you have to learn the writing skill were you already quite talented in terms of writing for a, a public audience or is that something that you have had to develop uh, I definitely had to learn as I went, like my writing now is, I still feel like I'm make, making up as I go along, but I'm, I feel like it's a lot better now than it was when I started. It wasn't too long ago, um, but it was, it, was a, it was a lot of practice. I had to kind of unlearn the way that scientific papers are written in that really kind of intentionally kind of, um, I guess, dry way where you have to kind of just really state things and, and try not to you know, I, I remember my supervisor kept telling me off for using too much flowery language and things. And I remember thinking, maybe I'm not, <laughs> maybe I'm not uh, best suited to writing scientific papers. But yeah, I had to learn it as I went along. I mean, the, the thing, the thing that comes from the PhD stuff is uh, that I find super valuable is that kind of scientific background. Like, so having a background in, in uh, volcanology means that people kind of automatically trust you to know what you're talking about or, or writing about quicker which means that you can kind of get interviews set up quicker and get certain stories quicker or get in with certain editors quicker. And, you know, it helps me recognize what's good science and what's just bullshit. Um, and uh, it also helps me recognize uncertainty is a massive thing and communicating uncertainty to the public as is really clear at the moment is so difficult, no matter what field you're doing in. But, you know, that applies to things like, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes and stuff too, uh, as well as a pandemic. So that was really helpful. Um, so yeah, I mean, the writing bit actually kind of, I had to learn it as I went along as the same with just how to do journalism, like I, you know, just random terms or how you start a thing and each publication has a different writing style. So even though they want your voice to be kept, they basically require you to set things out in a different way. And I, I just learned on the fly. Um, the, the science was stuff that really kind of stuck with me from early on. And I'd always say to people, if they're interested in doing science journalism, even though having a background in journalism is great, you know, if you're qualified as, as a journalist, that's great. But if you want to have a niche in science, having a science background really prepares you for reporting on stuff, even before you've got the writing stuff figured out. You kind of learn that as you go, I'd say. So I'd always say prioritize that kind of thing. So the writing stuff seems kind of esoteric and like, how do you start writing it? And you basically, the answer is you just have to start and practice. And when editors say, hey, that's pretty good, you should work out why they said that and then build from there so yeah it's kind of it's a lot of improvisation um i have to say for that writing bit okay great thank you well hopefully now anyone who's keen on writing something can take put pen to paper i'm sure that egu journals would always welcome uh, <laughs> blog writing 
Okay, so the next question that I'm going to um, ask, also some of you sort of touched on, but um, Liam, when you um, you have experience in both postdoc and non-academic work afterwards, what would you say the biggest difference in terms of the um, the job interview went? Were, was there anything that you were not expecting in terms of your um, interview compared to maybe in a in an academic field? Um, in terms of the interview, the we it was much more structured it's a set of, of questions and it was more about about fitting into a team than just about the academic interview is are you a smart person can you just get on with things by yourself can you start your own research group whereas in fact we we have questions that are basically set up to say if there is a dispute and your boss thinks something different will you eventually after all the discussion just do what your boss tells you because if you're going to work in a team eventually you've got some sort of hierarchy and how are you going to use collaborative, collaborative tools and how are you just going to be part of a um, just a wider infrastructure rather than just kind of bashing away as a postdoc on your own. So it's, it's much more in, in that, that sense. It was a big, big difference. Okay, thank you. Um, and Carly, when you went for the researchers in schools, um, did, what was the application process like? Was that quite fast or, or did it take a while? Um, so for, for researchers in schools, really quick, um, like Liam said, once you get into the real world, everything is quicker. Um, so researchers in schools have deadlines every half term if you're a teacher. Um, so because people finish their PhDs at different stages, so you fill in a written application, they invite you along to an interview within a week. Um, it's done during term time because they have to see you teach. So you, because you've never taught before, it's only a 15 minute lesson and they give you a topic. Um, so I was given energy. So I had to talk about different kinds of energy, but you have to try and, the, the biggest problem for me, I think being an expert as I'm classed as at school is trying to tone it down for the kids. Um, and then, um, yeah, so then it was a day interview and then I found out I had the job that day. Um, but researchers in schools, what they do over the summer holidays um, is a two week, um, it's not happening to date this year because it's a residential, um, but so they're doing it all online this year, but a two week residential where you get to know all the other people who are doing researches in schools. Um, you get to build a community together and it's your initial teacher training. So when you start on the 1st of September, you are straight in the classroom teaching. Um, so it's, it's a very quick, very quick turnaround. Okay, yeah, that seems to be one of the clear differences that we're hearing so far, the, the turnaround for, for interviews. Um, and now this is a, a question similar, but um, on the same sort of topic for you, Robin. Um, what was sort of the, the process like in going from um, a journalism role that was not freelance to more of a freelance position? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, again, quite made up as we went along. You know, I, I knew I wanted to leave the company I was at uh, for a bunch of reasons, but um, I, like I said, I didn't really know if it would work financially or, or you know, again, just professionally, because it's really individual. People's freelance careers aren't, there's no track to doing, like, here's how you do this thing. Um, but whilst I was working at the, my old company, I, I started to chat to, well, actually, the first thing I did was just say some nice things about people's work in other publications, just them on, on Twitter, um, you know, through tweets or DMs or whatever. And uh, one of them uh, uh, took a compliment well, and they said, well, why don't you try writing something for Gizmodo? Um, so I did, and then they said, oh, that's good one, you write another thing. And basically it kind of snowballs from there. Like if you show to one publication that you can write something on the subject, uh, eventually another publication will be like, oh, well, if you can write for them, why don't you write something for us? Um, and it kind of snowballs like that, but you have to be quite, you have to put yourself out there a lot, as in, you have to email editors persistently, like, you know, here's me, um, here's some ideas I have for articles, here's my background and why I'm qualified to talk about this, um, you know, get in touch, blah, blah, blah. And it just takes persistent, persistent emailing. And I think a really, the really big break for me came in, uh, like, later, in, later that year when uh, Nat Geo said, do you want to try writing something about this volcano? Um, and I was super nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I was bricking it, but like, if I'm thinking, if I if I do that and it doesn't, I don't mess it up, then maybe it will continue to go well from there. And then a few months later, the New York Times said the same thing, and then it just it just kind of again snowballed from there. But it essentially it takes doing a good few articles to some outlets and building on that success to kind of work for 
other outlets and basically becoming kind of like a reliable source for that kind of thing. So even though I write about earthquakes and plants and all kinds of things, normally if there's a volcanic event somewhere in the world, I'll be asked to write about the kind of science behind it by certain organizations like that. Um, so even though I'm a freelancer and they have loads of staff writers, I'm kind of their volcano person for a lot of stuff. And basically that's when I kind of realized that was the case, I felt a lot more secure and like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe this will work. Um, and it, yeah, it does. It just, it, if you just keep that up kind of thing, it does. And once you kind of maintain that base and you kind of get that level of like, people know you as that kind of writer for this thing, then you can afford to do like longer projects and longer things without worrying like, oh my, am I going to become irrelevant? Is someone else going to kind of write something better than that? And then it, 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 yeah, it's, it's the, the initial stages of it basically are quite chaotic and frenetic and I, you know, lost a lot of sleep trying to work out what the hell was going on and um, got some nice advice from my editors. But yeah, it's kind of, you do kind of feel like you're on your own a bit, you know, you just recognize that once you get into another outlet, that's another success and you kind of build on that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, um, there's no one way to do it, um, but that's the general way I think most freelancers do it is they start somewhere that gives them a break. And then if they prove themselves there, it, it kind of stacks up. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, it's nice to know that you're still sort of the, the expert in, in, even though you're not in academia where people get called experts, you're now in journalism, but you have a, an expertise still that's there. Yeah, I, although half of it is, is telling people that Yellowstone isn't about to erupt. <laughs> that's 50% of the time. It's like, nope, <laughs> it's not yet, not yet. I'm tempted to say, oh, oh wait, maybe, but I, I don't think that would be good for my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> and then um ashley you already mentioned a few things about about the interview process that you had um so maybe you could um sort of give us a clue on how you found your job how it was advertised or how you went about applying for it yeah so when i sort of made the decision to uh, i guess cross from academia to a non-academic role I, it was location that was the main driver um, for me, location and being able to do science still. Um, so I, to find my like role as it is now, I actually, I just looked for essentially geography and consultancy businesses in a range, like, you know, within a range that I was willing to commute. Um, and one of them was JBA that I found. Um, but once I found JBA, I actually just emailed them my CV and they kept it on file. Um, and then when they found, like, they were putting jobs, like, like they were advertising jobs, um, they also would go through their sort of stockpile of CVs. And so I actually was offered the interview for my job. Um, and whilst I was going through the interview process for my job, I was also offered an interview for another job um, in the same company. Um, so the interview process, mine was quite lengthier actually like from then what Carly and Liam mentioned um, I submitted my CV um, and then once I was invited like to sort of go through the application process I had to complete an assessment within like a like set time frame and um, to prove that I was sort of like capable of the job and um, that they and like the basic skills that they required then I was invited to attend a like a sort of telephone interview sort of stage one and then I was invited to essentially spend the day at the business um, or at the company I was given a tour I had my main interview I had to um, present um, a sort of seminar to some people as well um, and then I left sort of like a mess like I was really stressed and uh, tired from like quite an intense day but once I had got through all of those stages I was then offered the job within 24 hours so their turnaround is quick but the process for um, sort of some consultancy companies is a bit longer um, but yeah in terms of finding the role it's a case of having to know what you want to do I guess to some extent um, if you have an area of science or uh, research or writing I guess and teaching if you know that that is the sort of field that you want to try and apply your science in still then that can drive you at least most of the way to find the job that you need um, but yeah I think the market for sort of post PhD uh, jobs can sometimes just seem very large 
um, and overwhelming. So you do need to start kind of, yeah, whittle it down and know what, know what it's going to drive to the right place, I guess. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll also stick with you, Ash, for the next question. Um, what would you say the biggest challenge has been in your career in terms of this, either the difference to your PhD or the transition to um, the non-academic role? Um, okay, so I think it took me quite a while to actually build up the confidence to go from, I guess, almost like subordinate to senior colleagues to an actual, you know, same level colleague. Um, I think when, because I went through, like all through education, university and straight into PhD, um, I always had a supervisor for any, anything that I wrote or created or, or like researched. And I think being that like, as a PhD, you sort of assume that you're just that bottom rung of a ladder and everyone above you can tell you what to do. And you're just like there to gain the experience and that's it. And once I got into, into a role where actually having a PhD puts you like firmly sort of, you know, shoulder to shoulder with more experienced colleagues, it was having to learn to sort of put that imposter syndrome to one side and be, comfortable to put your opinion across and sit in a room where you have senior colleagues and managing director clients who you really need to impress but being able to say no I disagree with your opinion and this is why um, so I think that was the biggest challenge but then in a like in the private sector and in the sort of role and the company that I joined my personal development was really is cared about and it's not just me who cares about it but the company does as well so when I said I don't really feel comfortable with this immediately my personal development had uh, like lots of soft skill training so like project management and courageous conversations and like just building up all of those uh, skills that I needed um, so yeah I think yeah I, I I would say probably the imposter syndrome is quite a big one um, for me yeah okay Oh, it's uh, unfortunate to hear that imposter syndrome sticks around after academia. I don't, I, I would confidently say that I don't have it anymore. <laughs> well, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> yeah. um, and Liam, what do you find the biggest challenge going into a non-academic role after quite a few more years in, in the um, postdoc world? Um, there's a change in mindset. So with my job, there's definitely a very much a research element where it's all about creating new stuff and using deep learning on text and doing, doing very exciting stuff. But that's for our development process when we build a product. Once we're delivering that product, then no one wants to hear about your crazy new idea that they want the product that's been contracted to be delivered on the whatever of September to be delivered on that date and that you've got to just then knuckle down and really focus on getting that done. And if you, as you're doing it, you have some exciting new idea, but you've got to just be able to kind of be disciplined and resist the kind of temptation and just actually sort of focus on getting the thing that it says on the piece of paper that you will deliver done before anyone's lawyers get involved and everyone walks away happy. And then you can come back to them six months later with your crazy new idea as a, as a, as a next stage, but not just following your, your instincts in the same way you're trained to do as a scientist. Okay, great, thanks. I will point out some of the questions I'm asking are from the Q&A box. So I am trying to get around to them. There's around 30 questions in there at the minute, so we definitely won't have time for all of them, but thank you so much. We, we're still checking them, so feel free to send them through. Um, and we are asking, asking some of the questions to the panel. Um, so the sort of similar to this, Carly, um, you kind of have at least some aspect of academia still in your sort of day-to-day -day role on, on one of the days of the week. Um, what, how do you feel now that you've, you've done this re half re part research, part um, non-academia, where do you lie on how you feel about going back into academia or do you think you'll stay out? Um, so where do I lie? To be honest, I really don't know. Um, I love, I'm a physics teacher, so I love the fact that my job's secure for life now um, and the only way is up um, and I can stay where I want to be and I'll always have a job. So that's always a bonus. Um, but because I've done the research is in school method, um, I was speaking to some people who did it a couple of years before me and they've gone back into academia after teaching for five years as um, like um, lecturers and things like that because you actually, if, as long as you keep publishing while you're doing your researches in schools teaching, then it's basically like a postdoc and you paid more than a teacher would be paid. So you paid a postdoc salary 
Um, so it's a, a different kind of postdoc if you keep publishing and go to conferences and things like that. So I know some people have walked in back into academia quite easy. Um, I'm swaying more to stay in teaching. I really love my job. Um, it's the first time in my life I drive home and I think I love my job. I used to cry after my PhD sometimes. <laughs> I've never cried over teaching. Um, and, you know, it's just got a better work-life balance for me. Um, my biggest struggle, just going back to those, was the, the strict times. Um, being told I have to be at work for quarter past eight was a massive change for me. I was a person who some days I was quite lazy and would work from home. But as long as I hit my targets and as long as I get everything done that week for my supervisor meeting, my supervisor didn't care. You can't do that when you're not in academia, not all the time, uh, especially teaching. Um, even in lockdown, I have lots of different meetings I have to get in and lots of deadlines, which is very different to when I was doing my PhD. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and Robin, I guess you still have some academia in, in your job because of reading papers and synthesizing them, but do you also get to go to conferences or still in, uh, interact a lot with, with the researchers? Yeah, I mean, it's so the, the travel opportunities for a freelancer are a bit different for, from someone on staff. Like someone on staff can theoretically get sent to places a bit easier, but because I'm local to Europe, it means that I can be sent a lot of, uh, I basically write for all American uh, all the publications are right for in America. They're, I'm not entirely sure why that is. I think that's just basically where the money is and where a lot of the outlets are. Uh, and uh, if there's something happening in Europe that that is relevant to what I write about, they would send me to these places rather than send someone from America to these places. Um, obviously, that's kind of complicated now during the, the pandemic. I almost got stranded in, I mean, it's obviously not in Europe, but um, there, I was going to see some volcanoes in Ethiopia and I was very close to being stranded there for many months um and uh <laughs> which would have been bad um but you but you do get to travel to things if you can kind of justify it and if you have an editor that likes you uh, and likes what you do they can they can basically promote the idea of going to you know see volcanoes in this place or the other um yeah <laughs> I, 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 I can go to conferences whenever i want sort of thing um often as a journalist you you know you don't have to pay to go to these conferences the entrance the, the entry is free um but you some you are you often have to pay your travel there so it's kind of you know a mixed thing um but uh yeah there are there are kind of some grants you can apply for for conference travel but you know um sometimes it's really easy like uh, egu is super easy for me to get for me to get to um agu uh, is a lot more expensive and last year i decided not to go just because i kind of figured that as much as it'd be nice to see all these scientists and people i've written about and spoken to I'd basically be earning the same amount as I would be paying for the airfare. So it kind of is, it's kind of like a, it's, you do get to travel, but you kind of pick your battles sort of thing. Um, and uh, if you do like a geoscience thing and you're on an assignment and you want to write a feature on something and it's convincing enough, then you get to travel to, uh, you know, see earthquake zones and volcanoes and things like that. And um, it's kind of unpredictable. Often it's just like the Ethiopia thing came up the week before. So I didn't know that was happening. And there was something like, do you want to go here and do this thing? Like, yep. And then, but then the lockdown happened. So it was a bit, <laughs> a bit jarring, but these things can happen quite unpredictably. So, um, so you still get to go to all these things in the way that like scientists do, but I would say it's a lot more, you have to have a lot more flexibility in the way you, you the way you live your life. Cause these things can come in at weird hours at any time. You know, if you write for American publications, they can often come through really late your time. So helps be a night owl <laughs> um and uh, but yeah you're still welcome and 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 scientists kind of like it when you say hey tell me about your research and it's kind of nice that someone outside of academia is saying is interested in it so you often get invited to field work that they're doing um just because you want to write about their stuff you know whether it turns into a story or not is 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 like at the end of the thing so it's kind of yeah it's again quite unpredictable but you kind of take opportunities you think that's a good opportunity i'm going to travel there to do that you, you can take it and no one will tell you that no you can't do that um because if you're a freelancer you don't really have anyone say you can't do that for a story you just do it one thing that's changed in that respect is that i think five years ago if you left science you had basically left apart from your friendships but now in addition if you're on twitter like i follow everyone mm -hmm. on photography twitter i see all the new papers that are coming out i see all the discussion mm -hmm. that I feel quite linked into the community. I kind of discuss with people things that are happening and it's not like you're just, you're gone the way you would have been gone a few years ago, that it's now moved into open kind of online forums in a, in a quite a different way. So you don't have to feel like you're just abandoning it for the, for the rest of your life. 
Yeah, I feel like I get half my stories from people chatting about it. Well, from scientists on Twitter, I know, just going like, holy crap, or I didn't expect that, or saying something like that, and just being like, that's interesting. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, you don't feel like you've been exiled, for sure. Um, you just feel like you've just taken a, a step, a step away from it, but you've still got one foot in it in some ways. And Ashley, I think you also can still attend conferences and, and things through your work, right? Yeah, so this year um, there were five of us who had abstracts accepted for EGU, but obviously couldn't attend in the end. Um, and our abstracts were accepted, but um, our work is still in like the sort of the earth science and the geosciences domain. And so we actually collaborate quite a lot with universities. So the abstracts that we had accepted, they um, like we were lead authors, but the, we have also had some collaborations, um, for example, with Bristol and just recently, um, I'm currently on a paper which is currently under review with some partners at the University of Cambridge, UCL and some research institutes in Kuala Lumpur as well. Um, so we, we get to collaborate with people all around the world um, and we publish papers, we attend conferences, um, but I think also a really interesting um, aspect of not just still participating in academia is as well as being able to conduct novel research um you know of the standard of like or of the standard in academia we also get to apply that science in a real world context um so as well as you know modeling flood for example um on a small location we model it for an entire country or for the entire planet um, and we can make that commercially available. So we're, we're taking the latest research or we're conducting the latest research, but we're also applying it as well, which is really cool. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we are slowly running out of time. We've been talking for around 40 minutes. So I think um, maybe I'll ask uh, the final question for the panel and then um, for just any final tips they might have. So um, I'll start with, with you, Carly. What do you think is the best thing you um, take away from your, your, your current role now um, and do you think that your work-life balance has, has improved because of your job? Um, so I'll start, I'll do the work-life balance thing first. Um, definitely has improved. Um, I mean I know te people say teachers get lots of holidays. We do work through our holidays and not just 13 weeks off. Um, but I don't work weekends anymore. I don't work evenings. I, I, I keep to my set, my set times. Um, takeaways. Sorry, what was the other bit of the question? Key tips. Um, well, the other bit was um, what you think the best part of your current role is. The best part of my current role is probably, so I, because I've been to, to in university for 11 years, I push my students a lot to take them onto trips and to make them do, just aspire to be better. Um, they get told a lot in, in the area where I teach that they can't do it. They're not clever enough. You're a girl. You can't do it. The amount of people that say to me, I thought, I thought Dr. Mattis was a man is appalling. Um, and my favorite part is taking them to places like Oxford University, Cambridge, Manchester, Leeds. Um, and they love their days out and they love, like, I remember one kid walking around Oxford, just like eyes wide open and jaw drop, like, do you really think I could go here? And I'm like, yeah, you're getting grade nines. You might be in a deprived area, but you're clever enough to go here. Um, but chances of Oxford looking at his application are very slim, which is sad. But just getting them to see the other side, I suppose, is my favourite part of the job. Okay, that's great. And Liam, you touched on the fact that you've got a, a family at home and that was kind of one of your reasons for leaving. So um, what is your work-life balance like now that you're not in academia? Um, it's great to be honest. So normal times I do nine to five and um, I drop down to 80% and that's a genuine 80%. So during the lockdown, for example, I, that's when I've, I've made the switch down to 80%. So I do an hour's less work every day. Whereas I know I've got friends who are, who are academics and they were offered the same 80% deal during the lockdown. And they were saying, you know, you're not offering me any less work. You're just offering me a pay cut here. So, so I don't have to work evenings. I don't have to work weekends. I go, go to the office every day, get my get my stuff done and then I go home and, and take care of all the, the crazy amount of stuff that has to be done at home. So it feels definitely a lot less, uh, a lot less workload and gives more, more family time compared to my friends who are doing more uh, faculty jobs. 
And Ashley, when you mentioned the application process, you sort of said that you limited it by an area. So I guess the same question for you really, you know, what was your deciding factor for um, moving into academia and what's your work life balance like? Yeah, it's great. So I made the decision, um, like I wanted to basically be closer to my family, uh, like my parents, my sister, um, my grandma, and that's exactly what I did. So by the time I got to the end of university, I'd lived in Northern Ireland, I'd lived in the South of England, I'd spent time in Norway and the US and all over. And I enjoyed traveling, but I was done, <laughs> essentially. Um, and I missed out on sort of staying local and hanging out with my family. Um, and now, well, not during lockdown, um, but now I do get to go home every other week um, and I get to spend time with them and like, yeah, chill out with my nephew and stuff. And it's, it's been really good. And I think in terms of work-life balance, yeah, when I finish work for the day, like I'm done, I'm not checking my emails. I'm not picking my laptop up to finish stuff off. Um, like I work like 8.30 till 4.30 because for some reason I just can't last to five. Like I've just never been able to, um, but they're fine with that. And I work, like we have core hours as well. So we are flexible and I actually only have to be like present between 10 and three in the day. And actually any time around that I can work if I'm a morning person or an evening person, you can work around it. Um, and it's great. Like, yeah, when you book a holiday and you put your out of office on, the understanding is you are out of office <laughs> and it's yeah it's wonderful so i i have a feeling that robin your answers to this might be a little different as you've already mentioned a tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what is your work life balance like out of academia uh it's like it ranges from brilliant to abysmal um but <laughs> like it's i would preface that by saying like i love this job so much i would do i'm i regret nothing and I don't want to do anything else. I literally can't imagine doing anything else. However, um, stuff happens all the time, uh, whether you want it to or not. And I, you know, volcanoes have erupted two days before Christmas or whilst I've been away. And, and I can say no, but I kind of feel impelled to write about them. And I'm, as I write for a lot of American publications, I'm having really weird hours. Uh, so I, so in some ways, like, if you just decide, no, this week or month I'm going to have off, you can just do that and no questions asked. And you can, you can just, you know, bugger off for a month to do whatever you want. Um, but when you're in the, in the kind of phase of just like writing for all these places, you know, there are embargoed journals that are kind of releasing papers and, you know, things happening in the, in the real world that you need to write about. And, uh, you know, I've, st I've been up super late, crazy hours, you know, sometimes my partner hasn't seen me until like 3 p.m. the next day because I've been up doing edits to like seven in the morning. It can be crazy, but I would say that that side of it, if you kind of like the fast, crazy pace of things, that is kind of fine because you kind of make up for it with A, the freedom to kind of go, right, I'm going to stop working for a month now and just have this thing off or week or whatever. Or if you want to work, you don't have to work. You can work from anywhere. You have a phone and an internet connection. So I've worked from anywhere in London to like Berlin. I worked from the Arctic Circle a bit. You know, I actually remember accepting to write a story whilst I was standing on a, on a frozen lake up in, in the Arctic. You know, you can do, you can do work from anywhere. You can do anything, you know, you can, anywhere can be your office. And it is kind of thrilling to just be that flexible and, and, and able to accept work or not if you get to a position where you are lucky enough to do that. Um, but yeah, it can be, uh, like if you like a regular, <laughs> if you're particularly a morning person in the UK and all right for American places, or if you like a really regular like nine to five thing, it really, I would not recommend like going into journalism of any kind it really, because it, it, it really suits those who are able to be a lot more flexible and kind of, uh, kind of impulsive really <laughs> in a way where you have to decide, you know, suddenly there's a thing in the news and you think if I don't pitch this in 10 minutes, someone else is going to get the story first. So you have to make really quick decisions. Um, but I'd say that the rewards are easily worth it. It is absolutely thrilling to be able to write stories to these amazing places. And, you know, you can, you can control what you do for your work more than anything, really, if you're, if you're kind of a freelance journalist in that way. But yeah, there are points where you're, you, you can't really remember the last time you slept or had coffee or anything. You know, it's, it can be a bit delirious. But I'd say that roller coaster is worth it. For, for that kind of thing but it's a personal choice
Thank you. Okay, just um, to wrap up then, we will maybe just take your absolute top tip that you can give to people who are unsure if they want to leave academia um, and, and make that jump to non-academic. So I'll start with Robin. What is your top tip? Oh, my top tip is uh, you have to be you have to be persistent and, and know that lots of people have imposter syndrome. So I don't so I still have it to, to varying degrees. Sometimes it doesn't exist and sometimes it suddenly appears. Um, and I'll say that most journalists I know, apart from a few psychopaths, are have some degree of like, how are they letting me still do this? And basically, if you feel like you have no real kind of like, how do I get, how could I get started? I don't know how to do this. You just have to start. And most journalists are really lovely and most editors are really lovely, uh, even though they're obviously crazy busy. You just have to kind of get started and just give, try it out and be persistent. You know, it took, it took like 20 emails to the, 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 one of my editors to, to essentially give me a chance to be like, okay, 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 okay. Or give you a chance, you know? And then they were like, hey, great, this works. And, and it does, you know, they're generally quite supportive, you know, they're, they're, and I'd say that like that persistence, like don't matter how, don't worry about how doubt, doubtful you feel about your own abilities and stuff. Just give it a go. And if an editor gives you a chance, you seize on that and you keep going, you know, don't, don't let anyone or, or especially yourself tell you, oh, I can't possibly do this. It's just try it, you know, especially now, like during a pandemic, you can see how vital, like it's so obvious really obvious how vital like science journalists are and even though I don't write that sort of thing you know there's always a space for it because it's about telling things that are a often factually true with some interpretation which is super valuable <laughs> um but also um you get to tell these amazing sort of grand stories that are also kind of you know unlike anything else in the world and it's great fun so you know just try it like just and be persistent like get the emails of editors and just persist um that's my top advice like just please don't give up in a month and think oh this is not going to work it takes a while to build up that base but you, you can do it if you're persistent and you you know an editor thinks you're not bad at it thank you and ashley what is your top tip i just do it like don't rule it out and um, like science jobs in the private sector are advertised on the same list servers as academic jobs i I've seen jobs, I've advertised jobs, you know, on the likes of Cryolist and uh, like um, like atmospheric science list servers as well. Um, so I would just not rule it out. And if you have an idea of the job you want to do, or if you have no idea of the job you want to do, then just inv like investigate the adverts that come your way and just don't rule out the option of going private because you do still get to do science. Um, but you do also get some like bonuses like a work-life balance and career progression and some stability and where you're living so yeah just do it go for it okay great and carly what is your top tip um mine's very similar to ashley's i was just gonna say just if you're thinking about something different have a go because i know people who started researchers in schools with me they lasted a few months and went straight back to academia because teaching wasn't for them but you don't know till you've had a go um, and you might always wonder, oh, well, wonder what my life would have been like if I'd have tried this. Yeah, um, you can always change your mind. You can always keep looking on job adverts and getting a postdoc anyway. Exactly. You can always go back. So, yeah, I'll just have a go again. So. Thank you. And Liam, we'll conclude with your top tip, please. Uh, my top tip would be to go to meetups. So things like Python R, data science, that kind of thing, you'll meet a bunch of ex-academics, you'll have a beer and you'll be able to ask them kind of all the questions that are on your mind and, and get some real life experience of what's happening and info what's happening in your area. And, and what, just where do you find these meetups? Um, they're normally advertised through meetup.com, but uh, you find them through Twitter or Eventbrite, uh, that kind of thing. To, so I would look for Python R, data science meetup, Google that for your city and then You'll, you'll find them advertised online. Oh, perfect. Thank you. That's really great. So thank you ever so much to all of our panelists again for this uh, really informative and also um, quite inspiring uh, webinar for careers outside of academia.